Hello and welcome to the European Heart Journal. My name is Gerhard Hendricks and I'm sitting here in Davos, Switzerland for the 2013 Cardiology Update Symposium. And it's my privilege and pleasure to welcome Professor Bertram Pitt, who is one of the founding fathers of this symposium. Bertram, when did you start with Cardiology Update in Switzerland? Well, in we began planning this somewhere around 1973. I was at Johns Hopkins University at the time in the cardiology division, and I spoke to my chief, Dr. Richard Ross, about putting on a course in Switzerland, and he said, fine. And he had a former fellow, Dr. Paul Licklin, who was from Zurich, but had returned to Europe, and I think we had the first course in 1975. I think by that time, Paul Licklin had already gone to Hanover as chief of cardiology. The first course we thought was a great success. There were only 75 participants here, uh, but everyone enjoyed it. And at the end of that course, we said, well, maybe we should do it again. But we didn't want to do it every year because we didn't think there would be enough new changes. So we said, let's do it every other year. And gradually over the years, it's grown. I think two years ago, we had about 850 people here. And I think that just shows the quality. Uh, I think in the past, uh, to be honest, several drug companies would pay for people to be here. But in these days, drug companies are not doing that. And the people who are here, and this year it's over 550, are paying their own way. And that shows they're getting something from it. Exactly. It shows that it's attractive, it's unique. What creates this special atmosphere here in Davos? Well, I think if you go to the national meetings, American Heart, American College, uh, ESC, there's a tremendous amount of information. But I always feel I'm in the wrong place at the wrong time. There are so many things going on, it's hard to focus. Here, uh, there are main sessions, there are some satellite sessions, but you can sit here for the week and really get a good refresher course in cardiology. The other thing, I, I think we've changed a few careers along the way. Uh, we've changed clinical practice. And for me, as a clinical investigator, coming to these meetings, I meet outstanding faculty, and we create new ideas and new research. Uh, just at this meeting, I've formed two more new collaborations. Maybe they'll never happen, but we have ideas. We're trying to see whether we could make it work. And I think that's the fun in a small atmosphere where people meet each other uh, at dinners and uh, receptions and during the course uh, there's tremendous interaction and the participants as well. Yeah, that's, that's what you really feel if you participate here at Cardiology uh, Update. It gives you all. It gives you clinical cardiology, it gives you scientific updates, the latest studies from the, the top experts and for me I'm here the fourth or fifth time. I always appreciate that you can Go, that you can come so close to the to the top experts and and directly talk to them and uh, get to know them personally. This is really something which is which is outstanding uh, here in Davos, Switzerland. And hopefully, this course will continue for many many more years. Yeah, this is the twentieth anniversary, as I said, every other year, uh, and we're looking forward to many more and hoping to even make it better in the future. Mm -hmm. Turning to your scientific presentation uh, this week, you, you will uh, have a uh, speak on Friday morning on uh, aldosterone issues? Yes, I'm going to talk about a little bit of the past and about the future of aldosterone blockade. As you know, we've done three major trials in heart failure. The RALS trial, which is severe heart failure, systolic heart failure, Ephesus, heart failure post-infarction, and most recently the emphasis heart failure in New York Heart Class II systolic heart failure. In each of those trials, the aldosterone blocker, first with RAL spironolactone, but with Ephesus and emphasis uh, aplaronone, we've seen a reduction in total mortality, and in the emphasis trial, total mortality and total hospitalizations. Now, these have become class one indications in both American and European guidelines. But uh, disappointingly, if you look at the use of aldosterone blockade in chronic heart failure, it's about 
30, 40 percent. And if you look post infarction, it's only about two or three percent, despite the fact, on top of everything we know, we had this reduction in total mortality, even at 30 days. What's the reason for, for that observation? I mean, I'm from Germany, and we see exactly the same thing in Germany. The data are there, the patients are there, the guidelines are there, and nobody does it. Well, I think there are two explanations. One, spironolactone has been generic for many years. A Aplerinone is now generic in the U.S. and will soon be in Europe. There's not been a lot of marketing, and uh, ACE inhibitors and ARBs had a lot of interest. And the other part of it is, uh, after we published the RALS trial, there were reports that there's an increase in hyperkalemia, a famous uh, study from Canada, uh, Gerlink in the New England Journal, showing that a mark rise in hospitalization for hyperkalemia. When you look critically at that study, uh, they gave it to people we didn't give it to. Uh, they uh, gave it to people with worse renal function than we did. And most importantly, they didn't measure serially potassium. If you're going to use this, you have to measure potassium at the baseline and follow it. If you have a normal GFR, the risk of hyperkalemia is really minimal. If you have a GFR below 60, uh, you have to be careful. And we give it up to 30. Uh, and the closer I am to 30, the more concerned I am and the more I measure it. But there's tremendous risk, tremendous benefit. So if you don't uh, take, if you don't do it, you're missing an opportunity. And we've seen this on top of every drug, defibrillators, PTCA, it, it works. So I think this is a tremendous opportunity to further reduce cardiovascular risk, not by developing a new drug, but just using what we already have. The European, current European heart failure guidelines point that out very, very clearly, that uh, there is under-usage of that drug uh, in the field, that, that treatment strategy in the field. Looking ahead, what do you see at the horizon? What are the next steps to go in the field of aldosterone antagonists? Well, first of all, this fear of hyperkalemia we are working with a new potassium binding polymer that we've shown in early studies uh, prevents hyperkalemia. And for instance, if you have a GFR less than 60, greater than 30, uh, we saw we forced titrated spironolactone in patients with heart failure, a 39% incidence of hyperkalemia uh, without the polymer, with the polymer, we had about a 7%. And now we're treating people with hyperkalemia but in the next year, we're going to go back and take people who are currently contraindicated, mm -hmm. who have a GFR less than 30, greater than 15, and we're planning studies to give them an aldosterone blocker with the polymer simultaneously and look at the safety and see whether we can do this. Because as you know, this is a group that's extremely high risk and is hardly getting any medical therapy. So paradoxically, people at the worst risk are getting the they deserve least it most, they, yes. they, they don't So we're it. trying to enable that. The other new things, we're going beyond heart failure. There is good data uh, from aldosterone levels, independent of heart failure, if you have an infarct without heart failure, it predicts future events. And at the next uh, American College of Cardiology meeting this March, Dr. Gilles Montalesco is going to present the results of the reminder trial where we took people on the first day of an STMI uh, elevation uh, infarct and we randomized them to a plerinone and those results will be presented uh, at the American College of Cardiology. And there are other trials going on as well, uh, funded by the French government uh, with both ST and non-STMI and called Albatross that will be presented later, I believe. And then uh, we see in the future that we know that aldosterone blockade has been useful in resistant hypertension, but one of the real things in the future is people with obesity. You know the epidemic we have of obesity, but the adipocyte stimulates the production of aldosterone, and there's local production. So we're beginning to believe that in people who have obesity and the metabolic syndrome, that an aldosterone blocking agent will be important. Aldosterone changes the relationship between visceral and subcutaneous fat and also changes 
brown fat, which is good, it makes, makes it dysfunctional. It can't produce heat and increases inflammatory cytokines. So we need prospective trials, I think, uh, because we're dealing with generic drugs, that's difficult to get funding. But on the horizon, a new non-steroidal aldosterone blocking agents. We're working with the Bayer company uh, for a new agent. We've uh, published the design of a trial called ARTS, and we'll soon be reporting this results of the first phase two trial uh, against spironolactone and placebo. We're looking at doses, there'll be other phase two trials, but eventually, uh, I think, the animal studies suggest that these drugs at least have at least as good an effect on the heart, but less hyperkalemia. We'll have to see how the human results come out. And then there's good data suggesting not just coron uh, infarction, but people with coronary artery disease, high levels of aldosterone predict events. So eventually, I think we're going to be looking at people with coronary artery disease. There's also data that we can affect atherosclerosis, at least early atherosclerosis. We've seen in our own studies, lipid-fed rat rabbits, we prevent atherosclerosis. Several groups have looked at the APOE knockout mouse and seen that we uh, decrease inflammatory cytokines and change monocytes from the inflammatory to the anti-inflammatory type, decrease oxidative stress. So I, I think there's a great future for aldosterone blocking if we can learn to give it safely and convince people that it is safe and good. So there are many, many studies in the pipeline. There, there are huge expectations at the horizon. Thank you very much for giving us this historical uh, view back to the, to the roots of this Congress and sharing with us the latest news on aldosterone antagonism. And I'm very positive and looking forward to talk to you again in well, 2015. Hope, I hope I'm here in 2015 <laughs> to talk to you again. For the, for the next uh, edition. Right, for the 21st. The 21st edition of the cardiology update here in Davos, Switzerland. Thank you so much for staying with us this afternoon. Thank you.